It's the 80s Experience on FM 88.5 KSBR with J.J. Buchanan. He is one of the best drummers to come out of England during the late 1970s. Drummer for the amazing band The Jam during that time, Mr. Rick Buckler. Rick, how are we doing today? I'm fine, I'm fine. How's things? Wonderful, Rick. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your uh, busy schedule. I know you're busy there in London, and uh, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your schedule just to uh, be a part of the show. Oh, no, it's great. It's a pleasure. And uh, so I, I know you uh, you grew up there in England, and who were your musical gods like when you were uh, listening growing up there in England? Uh, I suppose I took a lot of influences from my older brothers uh, in what they were listening to because they were much more turned on to things like uh, the Rolling Stones and them and the Beatles and what have you. Um, but as I started, when I started to play drums, I sort of, I started seeking out um, you know the good drummers, if you like. So then I started to listen to this. Is you're talking about the early 1970s sort of period. So bands like um, Deep Purple were sort of emerging, and um, you know Led Zeppelin were coming up, and they seemed to have the best drummers for, for what I can recall. So and a lot of my peers were. Uh, that's the sort of thing that they were listening to. So that's pretty much where where I sort of you know uh, looked for finding you know really great drummers to listen to. I needed I needed some. Um, you know, some education, if you like, and that's where I looked for it. The band The Jam was a totally different sound. Rather than, you know, rejecting the influential sounds of the 1960s R&B revolution that was going on, you guys uh, incorporated it into your signature sound. I mean, there, there were other bands in the UK that were a part of the punk scene, and you guys were also part of that, but you guys were so different in a very good way. I mean, with your tailored suits and your signature sound, um, I mean, how, how did you guys all meet up? We all um, basically went to the same school. Um, and it sort of it sort of moved from there, really. That um, you know we wanted to play play live, and uh, uh, you know there, there was quite a lot of clubs around around the area that we, where we could play at weekends and what have you. So um, that sort of that sort of uh, thing that sort of thing threw us together, really, at school. And then um, you know moving on to to working, playing a lot of the sort of the, the, the social clubs and, and that sort of thing. I mean, most of the things we played were were covers of, um, you know, like the Kinks numbers and Beatles numbers. Um, that was the way that we could get work. And um, we didn't really write a great deal of our own material in the very early days. That sort of, gr- that sort of evolved later on. But, um, yeah, that's really where we started off, was at school. Rick, how did you guys get signed to uh, Polydor Records in 1977? Uh, well, we moved, we decided that we couldn't carry on playing the, the clubs outside of London because although we were being pl- you know, paid quite well, um, London was really where the scene was happening. There was a great sort of pub rock scene happening there. So we decided to, to go and play, um, you know, in those sort of clubs. And a lot of the bands that were, that were around there, the Police and the Stranglers, and um, not just the punk bands, but there was a lot of other bands playing around that scene. And, and I think what, what the punk thing did was it, it brought all of that sort of live music to the front. And, a lot of, and the record companies were really sort of looking around for, um, I think they realized that there was something exciting happening um, so it, you know, it, it drew all of their attention towards all the bands who who were on that scene, and of course we were one of them. And uh, we had several record companies looking at us, you know, much like all the other bands on that scene. But uh, Polydor got in there first. You know, I think it was just a, that was really that's all it was. Um, it could have been any one of the record companies, but they got there first. What's the background, Rick, on the uh, the band's debut single in the city? That one was the one, I suppose, that really stuck out for most people as, as the first one that we should release. And I think because we had come from out of the town, we'd come from out of the city, out of London, you know, and we're, we're basically um, had thrown ourselves into the middle of London. And, um, and I think with all, with all the excitement that London held for us, I think it was, just a, it was just a great anthem for what we were, you know, what we were doing at that time. Rick, did you feel that the uh, the second studio album, uh, This Is The Modern World, kind of felt kind of rushed there in the studio, in your opinion? It was, uh, it, yeah, you, some people say that they thought it was a bit rushed, but, I mean, the first album was cool because we, we'd we been rehearsing for that for about five years, but when it came to the second album, we pretty much wrote most of it in the studio, which was a new experience for us. So there was a, there was a very steep learning curve in that respect. I mean... I, I always look back on that album with great fondness, but I don't think it was quite what the record companies expected um, to find coming out of uh, coming out of the band, you know, out of the jam at that time. Wonderful, Rick. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, each album had its own, you know, story behind it, and the uh, the studio album uh, Setting Suns was that, was that originally intended as a concept album, and the uh, the Ed and Rifles uh, was that was that a song about class warfare? I I'm. 
don't know whether it was intentionally set out that way. I mean, it, it certainly started to look that way because I think what Paul was writing about was sort of, you know, politics with a small p, um, about what, you know, the, the, the class divide between the people who went to Eton and Cambridge and, and, and eventually went on to sort of rule the, the country, if you like, you know, because of their position of power. I, it certainly took on the feel of a concept album, but I wouldn't say that it was uh, an intentional thing that we did, you know, from the outset when that album was being put together, no. And the Jam's first number one hit was a tune called uh, Going Underground, and w- was that inspired by the uh, the British, you know, conservative government that was going on at that time? Um, I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, I, I, I don't think we were that inspired by politics in general okay. at that time. I mean, we I think we found, you know, politics to be sort of, uh, a, a distant sort of, uh, you know, do you know what I mean? It was. It didn't really feel like it was part of the real world. I mean, there we were, sort of like most most people of our age at that time, feeling quite disenchanted with the way the country was. You know, there were strikes, there was all sorts of uh, things going wrong, and 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 you know, people um, sort of rebelling against everything. So I, I don't know whether it was directly, uh, you know, attributable to any sort of influence, but. I don't know. I mean, I, I I think it's easy to sort of look back and 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 say that oh yeah, that was this, you know that was the reason for this, that, and the other. Um, but at the time, it didn't it didn't really feel like that. I think it was just us making representations on how we we felt. Um, you know, especially Paul um, felt about things. You know, the number one hit start was that was that really based on the uh, the Beatles Tax Band single? Because I know the bass ripped <laughs> and the guitar ripped and all that stuff. Oh, uh, I. Don't, I I don't know. All I'll say about that is we've all we've all got our influences, man. Do you know what I mean? So I mean, it was it, uh, it it you could say that, but it, it, when you actually stand them next to each other, they're not that close. But I think you can see they've come from a similar sort of stable. I think that's about you know. I wouldn't say we were we were trying to rip anybody off. No, or, no, 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 or, no, no, or yeah. whatever. But I think that you could see that there's there might be a Beatle influence there somewhere. You know. And I always love the song. I mean, the, the the big hit here in the states that I I remember growing up was a town called Malice, which was uh, basically imp- inspired by you know all the unemployment that was going on there in the UK and London during the 1980s. Was was that the inspiration for that song? Yeah, I think it probably was. I mean, and I think musically we we you know it's obviously a you know a, a hark back to um, you know the Motown feel and and that sort of thing. So, um, but we obviously had the edge on it, which was you know coming out of the lyrics so i mean i think that was probably one of our uh you know most successful commercially successful songs in any case and the tune precious uh, the jam became the uh the first since the beatles to perform both tracks of a double side 45 so to speak <laughs> on the uh the bbc uh pop music show uh top of the pops what was that experience like for you uh personally rick uh well it was great because i mean at the time we didn't we didn't think much about it but um, you know, soon after doing it, we we did sort of realise that that sort of thing doesn't happen every day. I mean, there haven't been many acts uh, that that could say they played both sides. I mean, we had it as a double A side. So what the BBC normally did was they say, well, look, you can't have a double A side as far as the BBC are concerned. You're going to have to pick one track. And uh, I suppose they must have liked us or something, but they they actually let us play both, which I, you know. You know, soon after the after the event, I, I think it was it was a real honour that they actually did that. I think cause normally they're quite sticklers about that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, that was great, really, to be able to do that. I mean, it gave us gave us two slots on a show that um, you know was big at the time. You know, in the UK, I mean, everybody watched some of the pops for what was happening. You know, in the UK charts. So yeah, it was great honour, really. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And in in 1983, I know you. Uh, I know the Jam broke up, and then you joined up with Jimmy, Danny, Ray, and Martin to form Time UK. How did that great lineup all come about? Uh, that came about because um, one of the A and R guys at Polydor put me in touch with Jimmy Edwards, and Jimmy Edwards is, he was a sort of solo artist songwriter, and he'd done a cover version of In the City, um, like an acoustic version. And I sort of knew him because he did some uh, musical uh, arrangements and what have you for Sham 69 that were also on uh, Polydor at that time. So it sort of grew from, you know, me and him meeting up and then getting some other members together with the band. There's Danny Casto from Tom Robinson Band. Um, there's Nick South, um, who actually lives in California now, believe it or not. 
Um, he was he had been in several bands like Sniff and the Tears, uh, and we uh, recruited him as a bass player. So we had all this sort of quite a, quite a mix of different people from different backgrounds um, in in Time UK. Um, I mean, I I really found that uh, to be quite enlightening because I worked with with only you know two guys for the previous ten years, and then to sort of find myself with these other great musicians. Uh, was was absolutely fabulous, you know, to uh, to have that uh, chance to do that. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Time UK. I thought uh, we did some really good things, but um, I, I don't know if you remember back then, you know, the, in the sort of mid '80s, things were were going very much over to electronic music and keyboards and and what have you. So we did find ourselves um, sort of out on a limb a little bit, but uh, still, I, I enjoyed it nevertheless. Rick, how did you guys come up with the uh, the band's debut hit single, uh, The Cabaret? I think that we just again we just really felt that that was probably um, one of the strongest songs um, you know from performing live um, uh, and it just seemed to be the one to, to choose really um, I think it had been released once before um, and hadn't done particularly well um, you know uh, under a different I think it was with Master Switch a band Master Switch that Jimmy was in had uh, released it but it, and it hadn't really sort of you know done particularly well so but we thought that we we. We had done it justice. So, um, like I say, I just think it was just one of the songs that we thought was, was, was the strongest one to go with. So, so we did, you know. And I know, Rick, at one point you kind of stepped away from the, the music business. And, uh, but now I hear you're, you're doing a lot of producing for other great artists. Tell me about the new band, If. Yeah, I was... Um yeah, I, just, this, I did a, a thing uh, last year with, uh, again, with, with a lot of other different musicians which I've uh, not worked with before. Um, there was Ian Whitewood, because there was two drummers in, in IF, and um, there was Ian Whitewood, who was uh, the drummer with Sham 69, and uh, there was a, a guitarist who was with a band called Long Tall Shorty, there was myself, obviously, uh, and Tim V, who, uh, you know, he was sort of taken over from uh, Jimmy Percy as singer with Sham 69, and we just decided to sort of put some songs together and take them out on the road and we did about eight or nine shows which was which you know it was a really good experience i've never never been in a band where there's been another drummer there you know so we had a lot of fun with that um but uh it was just a, a project that we got involved in and i don't really know whether we'll go back to it but it, it uh it certainly was very interesting to do at the time rick what what else are you personally working on these days i mean at the moment i've i've sort of gone back to i I had a period of, of, of managing a band called the Highliners, um, which I still do manage, um, but I sort of decided that I was going to take on some other artists as well. So at the moment I'm working with a, with a young girl um, called Sarah Jane. Um, she's a singer-songwriter, but she's got the most fabulous voice, and we've just finished recording um, about six songs of hers, uh, which we're, we're, we're hoping to get out before Christmas, around December. Um, so... It, this is, you know, this is a real early thing for her. This is this is her first release, and I've been getting her some some shows around the sort of south of England and uh, what have you. And she's she's going down going down a storm, you know. She's um, because she's fresh and she's got this this like I say, she's got this fabulous voice. I mean, I, I hopefully you'll you'll uh, you'll hear of her in the states quite soon, you know, because uh, I it, it just seems to me that she's um, because she's. She's so talented that, uh, um, you know, I'm just really trying to help her on her way through her musical career. Absolutely. Uh, Mr. Rick Buckler, thank you so very much for being a part of the 80s experience tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having us.